hello, true crimers! Disneyland, it's supposed to be a happy, great little family place, right? Uh, well, unless you, unless you died there, there are a lot of people, a lot of people have died at Disneyland. Did you know that? Ugh. But damn it, <laughs> I still love the place, and I would really love to go back one day once, uh, you know, I make $10,000 a day, because it's basically how much it costs nowadays to spend just one afternoon at Disneyland, you know what I mean? Uh, so, this is my second compilation video of my series from TikTok called Deaths at Theme Parks. Uh, this particular video will have 25 stories. My first one only had five videos, but now with the permaban on TikTok probably coming soon, I needed to get as many as I can in one video to save these things. Don't worry, you will have um, another full-length true crime story uh, tomorrow, depending on when I upload this, uh, Wednesday. Uh, and I'm just, just just chugging out these these compilations like cray cray. Eventually these compilation videos will simmer down. I just, you know, I'm really trying to get them all over here. But this video is going to include uh, several deaths from uh, Disneyland. We also have uh, Knott's Berry Farm, uh, various Six Flags places, um, and various others. So without further ado, these are 25 more deaths at theme parks. Viewer discretion is advised. I also warn you of my very cringy uh, Disney impressions throughout. I apologize immensely. Okay, bye, great, enjoy. <laughs> True Crimers, it is time for another Deaths at Theme Parks. Viewer discretion is advised. Today's story takes us to Six Flags Great Adventure, and it is located in Jackson Township, New Jersey. Uh-oh, I said a state name a little bit wrong. This particular theme park has been open since 1974, and it's a classic! One of the rides that they had there that was very popular was Rolling Thunder. It goes up and then it goes down and it goes really fast. So it's, I believe its top speed was 45 miles per hour. Now, one morning in August of 1981, the park was getting ready to open for the day like it did every other day. Usually what they would do is they would have an employee uh, get on the rides to do a test run just to make sure the ride was operating smoothly. You know, before the public, you know, gets on it and does crazy shit. Well, in this case, it was 20-year-old Scott Tyler. He had worked at this particular theme park for about three or four summers. Shortly before 10 a.m., just before they're going to open, seemingly out of nowhere, this is Rolling Thunder, by the way, not this whatever the Christ that is. Well, all of a sudden, they... Some employees see something fall from the kind of the highest point of the coaster. Just before this happened, another employee had said they thought they saw someone in the actual, you know, uh, train either kneeling or kind of standing at a lower position, but like facing the opposite direction of where you would be if you were on the ride, but standing or kneeling for some reason. And then just a few moments after that is when people see something fall to the ground below. What they saw falling was 20-year-old Scott Tyler. He fell from about 45 feet up in the air as the coaster was going at about 40 miles per hour. He was about halfway through the test run of the ride. He fell directly on the concrete ground below and he was pronounced dead there at the scene. The safety inspectors would go over uh, basically every single train of that coaster and they determined there was literally not one single thing wrong with any of the trains. The safety bars were all in working order. Everything was in top shape. What they came to the conclusion was is that Scott must not have lowered the safety bar on his particular seat basically going against the guidelines that are put in place for each coaster. 
and they believe that's how and why he fell. They can't confirm that he was actually standing up or kneeling. That's literally just what a witness thought they saw. Always be careful when on these rides. A witness to an amusement park incident would say, two people just flew through the air, 20 feet at least, and then they landed on their backs on the concrete. Hello, true Kramers. This is another Deaths at Theme Parks. Viewer discretion is advised. In actuality, we are going to the Ohio State Fair, and specifically the 2017 rendition. The Ohio State Fair has actually been going on since the 1800s, but obviously, over the years, it's adapted and changed. One of the rides they had there was called the Fireball. And this is some shit you will never see me go on. Basically, the ride consists of like six different rows that each hold about four people. And then it raises up about 40 to 50 feet in the air, and it swings you like a pendulum. So it goes back and forth, and then it like rotates. Yeah, no thank you. Not for me. July 26th, 2017. It was the State Fair's opening day. Several people would get aboard the Fireball. All very excited and anxious. Me pissing my pants if I was there. When, all of a sudden, a horrific catastrophe. The entire incident was captured on video. I cannot show it on here for obvious reasons. Don't want to risk it. But yes, you can see the video on various YouTube videos. So what happens is as the ride is swinging, one of the sections of seats breaks off and it just flies towards the ground. And it looks like it kind of smashes into like the metal like barriers. And then other passengers on the ride were basically being flung off. And they were falling from heights of about 20 feet or so and just landing on the concrete. This is what the seats looked like after the fact. Seven people were injured badly enough to go to the hospital, but they would all recover. Unfortunately, that could not be said for 18-year-old Tyler Durrell. He was on the section that flung off and landed on the concrete. Tyler had just recently graduated high school, and the same month this incident took place, he enlisted to join the Marine Corps, and he was actually all set up for training to begin the following year. So the inspection would reveal the reason why the whole seat flew off. It was because of corrosion over the course of about 18 years that this ride had been in existence. And apparently it was not cared for properly. Lawsuits were settled out of court. Money was rewarded to the families. No one was criminally charged. And Ohio passed Tyler's Law, which is to make rides safer. Oh, Jesus. Turn down the AC a little bit. It's hot as hell in here. Oh, God. Oh, shit. Oh, huh, Jesus. I'm an old broad. Don't make such sharp turns, you asshole. Oh, he's ready. Hey, slow down. I want to get there alive, I guess. What is this music we're listening to? Is this Nickelback? Okay. Oh, get the raid, Marjorie. Get the raid. I didn't, this is a bad part of town. I knew we shouldn't come this way. It's gross. Oh, Jesus. Okay. Do we have to go over the dangerous fire bridge? We're just going to the moor, I thought. Oh, hello. You don't have all of your face, sir. Okay, well, bye. Well, at least there's not snakes on this. On this ju oh, Jesus Christ almighty. Oh, God. This is another Deaths at Theme Parks. We're going back to Disneyland, folks. Viewer discretion is advised. One of my personal favorite rides at Disneyland, and by the way, despite all the stories I tell about people dying at this place, I really, really, really desperately want to go back to Disneyland ASAP. But one of my favorite rides is the Indiana Jones ride, which opened, I believe, sometime in 94, 95. You go on the ride after a, what feels like a 17 mile trek through a dirty, gross cave system. And then you board this wonderful all-terrain vehicle, and then you take an adventure through things. Well, back in 2007, a woman who was visiting Disneyland all the way from Spain um, would go on this ride. 
the Indiana Jones ride. Did I say that? Sure, yeah. Now, to those who have not been on this ride, it is a very herky-jerky, very kind of just like bumpy, it kind of throws you around a bit. Well, after the ride was done for the 23-year-old um, woman from Spain, she started to immediately complain of dizziness and headaches. It got so bad that she like, she couldn't, you know, keep her balance and she just, something was very wrong. So they had gone to the hospital that same night and they would determine that she actually suffered some types of brain injuries. What the specific injuries were, I, they didn't really say, but something had greatly affected her brain. And a couple of weeks afterwards, and she was in the hospital the entire time, she would die suddenly of a brain aneurysm. Now, while Disneyland, of course, didn't want to take any of the blame, the family still sued them, and they would end up settling out of court, and it was a private settlement, so the amount is not known for sure. I still miss this place, though. It wasn't water coming out of the slide. It was blood. Hello, true crimers. This is another Deaths at Theme Parks. Viewer discretion is advised. Pictured behind me was the water park formerly known as Waterworld USA, and it is in Concord, California. One of the slides that used to be there was called the Bonsai Water Slide. It was a slide that stood about six stories tall, and the Bonsai Slide sort of intermingled with another ride called the Cliffhanger. On June 2nd, 1997, students from Napa High School would be taking their school trip to the water park. And apparently it was a tradition that they would try to get as many kids in the water slide at once to break a school record. That year, they were going to attempt to get 33 students into the bonsai water slide. So a whole bunch of the students would begin to ascend the staircase that was the giant wooden structure now, according to the Waterworld USA spokesperson at the time of this incident, they claimed the students rushed past the lifeguard, ignoring all of the safety regulations, and they all just pushed past, and they all just got into the tube of the water slide, one by one by one by one. But then, according to witnesses, the lifeguard wasn't giving them any warnings and was just letting them get in. At any rate, the students piled inside the water slide and it created a log jam of sorts. Basically, the kids got stuck, which in an enclosed tube on its own is a horrifying nightmare for me personally or anyone who has claustrophobia. The slide not being able to hold the sheer weight of all of the students at once, it would break free from the anchors that were holding it in place. The water slide would then collapse on top of the slide that was underneath it, and students began to essentially just rain down from the water slide. The students were landing on trees. They were smashing into rail guards below. They were smashing into the water slide itself and then landing on the cement ground below. This caused the water that was running through the slide to become muddy and bloody and blood water was just shooting out from the end. In what I can only describe as an unbelievable miracle, there would be just one fatality throughout all of it a 17-year-old student by the name of Quimby Galati. She was a senior and she was going to be graduating at the end of the year and she had already had plans for college. 18 other students were very severely injured. There were broken limbs and fractures. There was internal bleeding. It was a nightmare. It was incredibly traumatic. And again, quite honestly, from that height, they were very, very lucky to survive. One of the most seemingly innocent rides at Disneyland would actually lead to a lifetime of tragedy for one family. Hello, true crimers. This is another Deaths at Theme Parks, and it is the story of Brandon Zucker. Viewer discretion is advised. On September 22nd, 2000, four-year-old Brandon Zucker was at Disneyland with his family. And going to Disneyland, you know, as a child with your family, and speaking from experience, um, is supposed to be this big, you know, magical adventure. And for the Zucker family, for at least a little bit, it was. Until it wasn't. Pictured behind me is Toontown at Disneyland. 
Mickey's Toontown opened in 1988 and was actually inspired by the film Who Framed Roger Rabbit? A movie that if you have never seen it, you are missing out, go watch it. So naturally, Toontown has a ride called Roger Rabbit's Cartoon Spin. Now, the ride itself didn't come about until 1994. So the ride is you board these little cartoon cabs, they're two-seaters, and you, you know, run through this little cartoon land, and the vehicles, they spin. And at a certain part of the ride, you can actually take control of the wheel and you can spin the car yourself. Now, the original design of the car itself, you can see there is an opening there. And that's where guests would enter the vehicle. But back then, that did not close up. So now back to Brandon and his family. Well, they would go to the Roger Rabbit ride. In the first vehicle would be Brandon's mom, his brother, and then Brandon himself. Brandon was positioned right next to the opening. This was against Disneyland's guidelines. They also didn't properly check to make sure the lap bar went all the way down on him. So at one point when the vehicle was in a spin, Brandon, he fell out. Because there was no door to catch him, he completely fell out. And then he was run over by the vehicle behind them. And to make it more tragic, that vehicle had his father and grandmother in it. Brandon got pinned underneath the car, and at one point, it dragged him about 10 feet, and he was folded in half. He was stuck for 10 minutes that way. He was finally freed, and he was still alive. He experienced extreme physical trauma to his body, and he would become brain damaged. And from that point moving on, he would never speak or walk again. Brandon would be in and out of Children's Hospital, where he was constantly battling this brain injury. Eight years after the incident, when he was 13, he would go to bed and then never wake up again. He passed away from complications to his injuries. Since then, Disneyland has added the door. They've also put sensors in the front of their vehicles, so this can't happen again. Hello, true crimers! It's time for another episode of Deaths at Theme Parks. And today we're going to a park we've never been to in this series. America's first theme park, Knott's Berry Farm, located in Buena Park, California. Knott's Berry Farm actually originated in 1920. It was like a little roadside kind of park. And now it's one of the most popular theme parks in the country. It gets over 4 million visitors every single year. It has 40 attractions, including 10 roller coasters. Fun little personal fact about me, there's a ride there called Montezuma's Revenge. And I've been on this ride, but do you want to know in what capacity? When my mother was a few months pregnant with me, allegedly she didn't know, she went on Montezuma's Revenge with me. <clears throat> God damn it, that explains a lot. <sighs> anyway... One of the oldest rides in the park, which opened in 1960, is the Calico Mine Ride. And it's located in the ghost town portion of the theme park. You go through tunnels that are dark and kind of creepy. You go through mines, you see the animatronic dudes, you know, pretending to mine. And it was the Calico Mine Ride that saw Knott's Berry Farm's very first death. Unfortunately, I cannot find a photograph of the man in question here. A 55-year-old Knott's Berry Farm employee by the name of George Burks was working on the Calico trains. He was one of the ride's three engineers that basically constantly were working on this ride to make sure everything was running smoothly. He had been doing it for about three years when, on October 21st, 1996, the theme park itself had closed down for about an hour or so because later in the evening, Knott's Scary Farm would be opening. So around 6 p.m., um, he was trying to separate two of the train's cars, and there's five cars involved in one train. He did manage to split them up, um, but then all of a sudden the two cars he had separated, and he was now in the middle of them, they came rolling together at a pretty decent speed, and he was caught in the middle. So, unfortunately, George was crushed in between two of these cars. There were no park goers in there at the time, of course, but there were employees kind of nearby. From what I understand, no one heard him react or scream, so if, you know, I guess you kind of have to assume that hopefully this was a quick and painless death. 
but I don't have any kind of confirmation of if he was killed on impact or if he died later in the hospital. The train was closed indefinitely after this incident, but obviously it has since reopened, and the Calico Mines operates to this day. Hello, True Crimeers! It's time for another episode of Deaths at Theme Parks. Today we are traveling to Six Flags Great Adventure in New Jersey. We are going back in time to May 11th, 1984. Pictured behind me is the Haunted Castle. This was a walkthrough attraction which just basically meant that patrons would go in there and walk around it like a normal haunted house. Things would be hiding, they would jump out at you. You got mummies, you got vampires, you got ghosts. There was a mix of props and live actors going around scaring people. It technically wasn't even a building. It consisted of two sets of eight semi-trailers. 6.35 p.m., May 11th, 1984. A young boy befriended a 14-year-old boy at the park. The 14-year-old boy offered to guide the younger boy through the castle. And because it was dark, the 14-year-old boy used a lighter. The reason this particular area they were walking through was dark was because the strobe lights that were in there were malfunctioning. The boy holding the lighter accidentally bumped into a foam wall, and it quickly ignited with his lighter. Now, the construction code required fire alarms, but the township's building inspector said you don't need to put in the fire alarms because these are not permanent buildings, they're temporary. The AC unit inside of the haunted castle was on, of course, and it would begin fanning the fire, which caused it to spread really quickly. There was a lot of foam and a lot of props made from cardboard, wood, so the fire was like, boom. There were approximately 29 individuals inside the haunted castle at the time, including a group of nine local teenagers who were there on a high school trip. 21 people managed to escape. Seven of those people were treated for smoke inhalation. But eight of the nine teenagers who were in there, they died. It was chaos. People were bumping into walls. It was dark. The smoke was everywhere. And it wasn't even realized that people were dead until later that evening. There were eight charred human figures on the ground that they assumed were mannequins. But obviously they weren't. They were burnt so badly, there was nothing recognizable about them. All of them died from either smoke inhalation or carbon monoxide poisoning. So unfortunately, they were awake while they were being burned alive. They would discover the building had no permit. There was no occupancy limit, no fire and smoke detectors, and no sprinklers. So Six Flags was charged with aggravated manslaughter, and in the end, they were found not guilty. The family members each received $2.5 million, and obviously the haunted castle was closed forever. Hello, True Kramerers. Welcome to another Deaths at Theme Parks. Viewer discretion is advised. Oui, oui, oui. This is Disneyland in Paris, Paris. In the early morning hours of October 2010, on the It's a Small World ride, a 53-year-old technician was inside the ride working on the attraction. Now, allegedly, he was working in the water inside the flume, which is essentially the metal bars that drag the boats throughout the attraction. Now, he made sure the ride was turned off, but at some point, somehow, the ride got turned back on. Being inside the flume is considered a very dangerous spot, and unfortunately, one of the boats would strike the worker, and it dragged him underneath the boat and dragged him along the tracks under the water. This likely happened for at least a few minutes. Unfortunately, he would die a few hours later at the hospital. His injuries were absolutely catastrophic. The ghost of Tower Johnny haunts Kings Island Amusement Park, but what is the real story? Hello, True Crimerers. This is the true story of John Harter. Viewer discretion is advised. Now, John here would eventually be nicknamed Tower Johnny, and legend says his ghost roams Kings Island, scaring people half to death. But let's separate facts from legend. Kings Island is a very popular 364-acre amusement park located in Mason, Ohio. It opened in 1972. A ride that opened with the park in 1972 was the Eiffel Tower. This attraction stands at a towering <laughs> 315 feet tall. 
It's not a ride, but it is like an elevator that brings you up to an observation deck to view the entire park. On Friday, May 13th, 1983, yes, Friday the 13th, 17-year-old high school student John Harter was taking part in a grad night that they were hosting at Kings Island. He was there with a whole bunch of his classmates from Delaware Hayes High School, and they were supposed to be graduating on June 5th of that year. And John was just a couple of weeks shy of his 18th birthday. Now, allegedly, John and the little group of friends he was with were either drinking at the park by smuggling in alcohol, or they had gotten drunk before they went inside the park. And so the story goes that he was, in fact, drunk. Now, at some point around 10 p.m., John got separated from his little group of friends, and he decided he wanted to climb the Eiffel Tower. Yes, climb it. He would hop over the nearly six-foot-tall fence to get into the inner workings of the attraction. He then began climbing the interior emergency stairwell. The understanding at that point is that he got onto some sort of beam and was trying to freely walk across that beam, when all of a sudden, the counterweight of the elevator struck John in the head. He then lost his balance and fell down the elevator shaft. He would fall roughly 50 feet and land on his head on the top of the elevator that was rising. Now the legend says that he was sliced in half by a wire or he was decapitated. None of that is true. He died from blunt force trauma to the head. The poor decision and the 50 foot fall is what took his life. His friends would end up finding his body. And now he is known as Tower Johnny, the young high schooler who now haunts the park. Rest in peace, Johnny. Hello, true crimers. It's time for another episode of Deaths at Theme Parks. And today, we're going to Walt Disney World in Florida. Pictured behind me is the monorail. Anyone who's ever been to Disneyland or Disney World is very familiar with this attraction. Oh, by the way, yes, I am providing context to the story. The monorail is just a good way to get around the park, get to the hotel, or in this case, go to Epcot Center. It's just a good way to unwind and rest your feet a bit. And also get great views of the park. But the monorail would be anything but relaxing on July 5th, 2009. Pictured behind me was 21-year-old Austin Woonenberg. He was a monorail pilot. That was his job, and he loved it. Which, that was a quote from his uncle. Austin absolutely loved his job. He loved interacting with the people. In fact, he showed his love for people not but a few weeks before this incident. He allowed a small family to sit aboard with him in the pilot's area. He was described as a geek who wanted to work the ranks to be someone like a Bill Gates. He was a genius but remained humble about that fact. But most of all, he was described as a wonderful friend, a wonderful son, and a wonderful boyfriend. The monorail system, which operates several trains, and goes to several different parts of the resort, there is a built-in safety feature that prevents two trains from ever kind of colliding on the same track. Basically, when the two trains come too close to each other, the ride is supposed to stop itself. And any monorail pilot who even comes close to creating an accident due to negligence is removed from the monorail fleet ASAP. They're not even given a second chance. They get moved to a different part of the park. So on this day, Monorail Pink was cleared of the station and it was stopped. And it was waiting to be moved over to the next beam, meaning to go to a different part of the park. Kind of like a train switching tracks. And then Monorail Purple, which was being piloted by Austin, with very few people on board, by the way, this was very early in the morning, he was given clearance to enter the station. So he did. And then someone in the control tower, allegedly, gave permission to the pink monorail driver to reverse because apparently it had over-traveled its area. But the beam switch had not yet happened. So Monorail Pink went back full speed. Austin in the purple monorail, he saw what was happening and he tried to reverse his train immediately, but he couldn't do it. It was too late. Trigger warning, I'm about to show a brief little accident. There's no bodies in this picture. At the ticket and transportation center, the two monorails would collide. Austin was not at fault at all. The safety measures that were in place for some reason, well, didn't do their job. 
Austin was crushed on impact, and he was killed. He was the only fatality. The family sued, and they settled out of court. This would be the last thing a two-year-old boy at Disney World would ever see. Hello, true crimers. This is another Deaths at Theme Parks. Viewer discretion is advised, and I would also issue a trigger warning. Some parents may not want to watch this one. This little guy was two-year-old Lane Graves. In June of 2016, he and his family from Nebraska would go to Florida to visit Disney World. And of course, going to Disney World or Disneyland is any child's dream. At Disney World, they have a man-made lagoon, and they've called it the Seven Seas Lagoon. Well, the lagoon had an issue with alligators. Now, Disney did not put the alligators in there. They essentially came naturally. It's such an issue that they caught an alligator at least once a day. The only warning signs that they had up around the lagoon was no swimming. There was no mention of wildlife or alligators specifically. On June 15th, 2016, Lane's mother would bring the kids down to the lagoon area. And this was around 8 o'clock at night. A few other park goers had actually seen alligators that day. In fact, just a half an hour or so prior. They alerted the staff at Disney, but it would be too late for Lane. As he was building a sandcastle on the shores, an alligator was prowling the shoreline. It was essentially in predator mode. Lane was basically standing in a couple of inches of water. He leaned over to scoop up some sand, and that is when the alligator lunged up and grabbed him by his head. He fully engulfed the head of the two-year-old boy, and then his father... <clears throat> this is heartbreaking. His father saw it happen, and he just ran to the alligator, and he just put his hands right in the alligator's mouth and was trying to rip or pry the mouth open. He did not care what pain he would have. He didn't care if the alligator were to bite him. He just wanted to save his boy. <sighs> but he couldn't. The gator would drag the boy into deeper water. And witnesses said all they could see at that point were the little boy's shoes um, kicking in the water. His body would be found and recovered the next day. Experts wholeheartedly believe that this was a predator attack. The alligator assumed that he was just a small animal since he was bent over. They then found alligators and euthanized five of them. They don't know if they got the one that killed him. The family decided not to sue and they set up a foundation in his name. Hello, true crimers. This is another Deaths at Theme Parks. And it is the story of little Ryan Beckstead. Viewer discretion is advised. Pictured here behind me is Lagoon Amusement Park, which is located in Farmington, Utah. Now, it actually technically opened in 1886, but it would just obviously adapt and grow over the years. And now it's a 95-acre park. It has about 55 attractions, including 10 roller coasters. In 1985, they opened up a children's roller coaster called Puff the Little Fire Dragon. It's a very slow-moving coaster. It goes about 16 miles an hour as the top speed. It runs about 198 feet long, and the tallest it goes is about 11 feet. And you might be wondering, how on earth does someone pass away on a children's roller coaster? Well, in May of 1989, Ryan Beckstead was at Lagoon with his family. So Ryan was on Puff the Little Fire Dragon, and his ride, his turn, had come to an end. The coaster is essentially just one big loop. Now, when they got to the end of the ride, there were apparently two coasters that went past the platform. And Ryan, thinking that the ride was over, because it was, he had stood up. The operator at the time, who was an 18-year-old who had just recently started there, asked Ryan, do you want to go for another turn? When she asked that, Ryan had one foot on the ride, one foot on the platform. But that's exactly when the coaster began to move up an incline. And then what happened was Ryan fell down onto some lower tracks. He got like grease all over him. And then he was trying to climb back up. At this point, his parents see what's happening and his dad full on jumps the fence, 
They're screaming, stop the ride, stop the ride. The operator is not hearing them until it was too late. She pulled the brakes, but it was, it was, it was over. As Ryan was trying to climb through back up the tracks, the coaster sort of went backwards and it ran right over him. It struck Ryan and he died. The operator was seen falling to her knees and screaming, I've killed a little boy. And Ryan's mother was screaming, you killed my boy, you killed my little son. The investigation would learn that there was no criminal negligence involved. This was a very unfortunate accident. And I believe lawsuits were filed and then those were settled privately. And Ryan, by the way, was just six years old. The theme park today is still open but it is temporarily closed due to the pandemic, I believe. The audience heard her screaming, I don't want to die, and then screaming for help. But help would not come. Hello, true crimerers. This is another Deaths at Theme Parks. Viewer discretion is advised. Pictured here was 20-year-old Kelty Byrne, and she worked at a place called Sealand of the Pacific. It was basically like a, a lower end kind of knockoff sea world, if you will. Of course, animals are either bred in captivity or they were captured from the wild and brought to places like this to entertain. Well, one day um, there was a show going on and Kelty was a part of the show and there were three orca whales inside the tank. One of those orca whales is someone we're familiar with on this page because I've talked about him a couple of times. That would be Tilikum, the whale. The other whale was named Nootka, and the last one was Haida, or Haida, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. On February 20th, 1991, Kelty was standing just kind of on the edge of the tank. Kelty would then slip into the pool um, and she tried to swim out, but before she could actually grab the ledge, one of the orcas grabbed her and began to pull her around the tank or the pool. It's believed at this point the whales were not really aware what the hell was going on. They thought this was probably some kind of game or what? I mean, these are animals that shouldn't have been in the tank to begin with, but basically what happened next was a nightmare. Between the three orca whales, they were tossing Kelty around like she were a toy, like she was a rag doll. They would pull her into the water and drag her beneath to the point where she was, you know, almost drowned. And then they would bring her back up to the surface. And then you allegedly could hear her screaming, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. And then screaming bloody murder, screaming for help. And there were trainers who were nearby who were doing everything they could, but they were unmatched with three, you know, giant orca whales. This went on for quite a long period of time as she's essentially being tortured. She's being dragged underneath, she's being tossed around, she's being kind of yanked by two whales. And eventually um, they bring her down below um, for far too long and she ends up drowning. They would not be able to retrieve her body for at least like two to three hours or so. She was bruised and she had bite marks all over her. I can't, I can't even imagine that. I can't, I, that's just, that's just horrific. These animals should not be in places like this. Hello, true crimers. It is time for another Deaths at Theme Parks. Viewer discretion. It's advised, I think. I think it's, yeah, it's good. So for this video, we're going to Knott's Camp Snoopy, which was in Mall of America. I believe it opened sometime in the mid to late uh, 90s, the, the theme park aspect. But now it is basically called the Nickelodeon Universe. That's a lot of fun, huh? Ugh. The ride where this unfortunate incident took place was on what was then called Paul Bunyan's log chute. It was your typical, you know, water ride. You're in a log. You go in this little log thing here and you go around and then at the very end there is a, uh, you climb up and then kind of like Splash Mountain, you go down a big drop. Now the Mall of America, to those who don't know, is in Minnesota. 
On August 2nd, 1998, a 12-year-old boy was there with his family and they were visiting from Wisconsin. The family had boarded the, the log and I think they took up a couple of them. Um, and then they, you know, were going around the course of the ride. Towards the end of the ride, when you start to go up the big hill, that is when the 12-year-old boy, whose name I, I can't find, he was reportedly becoming very nervous, very scared, and he didn't want to go down the drop. So, unfortunately, in his panic, he tried to stand up and climb out of the ride before it would go down the drop. From what I understand, once the ride was about to pivot and go towards the drop, they noticed what was happening and they stopped the ride. But unfortunately, at this point, gravity was kind of taking over. The boy was trying to reach out to grab something. His family's obviously trying to pull him in. But when gravity took over, the log, it shot down the, the drop. And unfortunately, the boy fell out of the log and he fell down the chute, as it were. And on his way down, he struck his head against one of like these uh, fake boulders. And he was immediately taken to a nearby hospital and was went into surgery right away. But unfortunately, the young man died of his injuries. The ride was immediately closed and inspected. Now, by all accounts, the park did everything right. The ride stopped. I mean, they, they powered it off. But unfortunately, just where it happened, it, it, it just the ride just fell. There were no seat belts as well. Most rides like this don't have them. If the family sued, I can't see if they were successful or not. That stuff is usually kept private. Ha <laughs> ha! Hello, true crimers! <laughs> it's time for another theme park death! Ha <laughs> oh. ha! We're going back to the deadliest but happiest place on Earth, Disneyland, huh? And we're hopping, holy Jesus! Oh god, it's just the abominable snowman. I thought it was Nick Nolte. Oh, hello, sir. Ha! <laughs> All right, talk to you later, bud. We're hopping aboard the Matterhorn bobsleds again. January 3rd, 1984. A 48-year-old California resident, Dolly Regine Young, was aboard the Matterhorn bobsled. The Matterhorn here is considered a tubular steel continuous track roller coaster. It's been open since June 14th of 1959, so this is like... OG Disneyland. The very first death Disneyland ever had was actually on the Matterhorn bobsled ride. I did, however, cover that story briefly on my main page um, in during a theme park death video. So go check it out. Even though it looks fast and is considered a roller coaster, it only goes 27 miles per hour, a speed at which most people drive here in Arizona on the freeways. And it's only a two minute ride. But on that brief two minute ride in 1984, Dolly Regine Young would meet her end. It would later be determined that her seatbelt was not fastened. She was alone in her sled, so it's not known if she unbuckled herself or if they just didn't buckle her at the beginning. If you've never ridden the Matterhorn, it's kind of uncomfortable if you're sitting with someone else because you're literally like sitting on the person behind you, you're sitting on their lap. Somewhere around the halfway point of the ride, because her seatbelt was unfastened, Dolly was thrown from the car itself. Now, in the original Matterhorn death, that's basically the end. That's how the person died. Dolly would have a much more gruesome death. When Dolly was thrown from her bobsled, she actually was thrown and landed onto a lower track. And because this ride can operate with multiple different cars going at the same time, when she landed, another bobsled car was going and it literally ran over her. To the point where it actually stopped the ride from going because it had gone over her body. Her head and her chest had become crushed and pinned underneath the second bobsled. Specifically, she was pinned underneath the wheels. From what I've been able to find out, and there's not very much on the story, and I can't find any pictures of Dolly herself, Dolly would have died pretty quickly after being crushed by the second car. The ride was closed um, for a little while afterwards, of course, but reopened, and it's still to this day one of the park's most popular rides. It's a ride I very much enjoy. Oh, God. just you again. I thought you were Nicolas Cage, but okay. Huh? No? Not the bees! <laughs> Hello, true crimers. It is time for another episode of Deaths at Theme Parks. Today's story brings us to Six Flags at Darien Lake, New York. 
This particular variation of Six Flags opened in May of 1981, and it actually opened as Darien Lake Fun Country. It is 1,200 acres large, and it sees about 1.5 million visitors every year. In July of 2011, one of those visitors was Sergeant James Hackamer. He was 29 years old, and he was from Gowanda, New York. James was an Iraq war veteran, and serving as a U.S. Army sergeant in Iraq in 2008, he would lose both of his legs and his left hip due to a roadside bomb. James never lost his spirit, and he loved his family, especially his two little girls. Pictured here behind me is a roller coaster you will never see me on. It's called Ride of Steel. The original ride in Maryland is actually named Superman Ride of Steel, but this park decided to drop Superman from its title in 2006. It is 208 feet tall. No, thank you. It can actually reach a speed of 80 miles per hour. No. Nope. It lasts about two minutes. That's longer than I last. What? So, in July of 2011, James was at the theme park with his family. Now, Ride of Steel is a ride that actually has posted rules that says you must have both legs. This is because the lap bar goes across the legs. However, when it was James's turn to board the train, allegedly the staff there did not ask him any questions, didn't say anything, and they let him board the train. Now, investigators would go on to say that James Hackamer either didn't see the rules or he blatantly ignored them. The rules also state you must have sufficient body strength. Investigators would also say he was given a pamphlet discussing these rules. But again, this is allegedly. So, towards the end of the ride, when the coaster was going down its final hill, which is at an angle of 68 degrees, James, because he wasn't properly secured in due to his amputated legs, he fell out. He hit the front of the coaster first. He then hit part of the track and then landed 135 feet below on concrete. They don't know at what point he died, but he did die of blunt force trauma. Now, investigators and the park people were quick to blame James for this, but this wasn't his fault because the ride operators should have known to tell him he cannot go on this ride. His family said for at least a minute on the ride, he felt like he was normal again, and the family would win a lawsuit against the park. I don't know how much. Hello, true crimers. Today, we are talking about another death at a theme park. Viewer discretion is advised, and I mean no disrespect by telling the story, I just want to tell the story. Today, we are traveling to Adventureland, which is located in Altoona, Iowa. This is a little outside of Des Moines. This particular Adventureland opened in 1974. Been around for a long time. It claims to have over 100 different attractions and shows. One of those attractions is the very popular Raging Rivers ride, which this type of ride is at many, many, many theme parks across the world. In fact, one of my worst deaths imaginable happened on a ride just like this in Australia. On July 3rd, 2021, the Jaramillo family was at Adventureland enjoying themselves. This included 16-year-old David and 11-year-old Michael, and the two of them were aboard one of the rafts with their family. This particular raft, not this one pictured here, but the raft they were on, well, earlier that day on July 3rd, it was actually taken out of service. Apparently, one of the bladders had uh, lost its air, so it was deflated. And it wasn't just this raft, it was actually several rafts that had deflation issues. Now, this was earlier in the morning of that day, and they repaired the raft, and then they put it back in service. Around 5.45 p.m., the raft was put back on its track. And shortly before 7.30 p.m., the Jaramillo family would board the now-repaired raft. Now, just moments after the raft took off down its path, it actually began to take on water. This was because when the family boarded it, it lowered the raft, which is normal. And then later they would find out that the raft had scrapes and scratches all over it because it was scraping the bottom. Now, I'm about to show the image of the raft turned over, so trigger warning. No, there are no dead bodies seen. So here we go. So then what happened was the raft there in the background flipped over and it capsized. Now, because they were wearing seatbelts, um, the family was trapped basically upside down in the water. 
The father had actually crushed his shoulder, so he was unable to do anything. 911 calls were placed, but it was so hectic, and it took the dispatchers a few minutes to finally alert the firemen to go. They wouldn't get there until 30 minutes after the call. No one who worked at the park rushed to help. It was just patrons who were there. 11-year-old Michael Jaramillo would drown. He was underwater for far too long. His 16-year-old brother was also badly injured, and he was put into a medically induced coma. One month later, on August 3rd, after going back and forth between life and death, 16-year-old David recovered. He will need continued physical therapy, but they would lose Michael forever. One of the deadliest roller coaster accidents of all time is one that most people have never even heard of. Hello, True Crimers. This is another episode of Deaths at Theme Parks. Viewer discretion is advised. Pictured behind me is the Battersea Fun Fair that was located in London. The Fun Fair opened sometime in the early 50s and then it eventually would close permanently in 1974. By far the most popular attraction at the Fun Fair was the Big Dipper roller coaster. It opened in 1951. It was a wooden roller coaster that used a rope lift pulley system. It ran about 1,200 meters long, and its highest point was about 15 meters, 49, 50 feet or so. This was its steepest incline, so nothing too crazy. In 1970, there would be a huge fire that broke out on the ride, but no one was killed. But on May 30th, 1972, there would be a tragedy that would claim human lives. It was a late but still sunny afternoon. The fun fair, as usual, was crowded, and 31 people were about to board the Big Dipper roller coaster. They were on the verge of experiencing that thrill, that fear that sets in, but little did they know the fear would become reality. This was a group of teenage friends, by the way. This is a photo taken just before they would board the Big Dipper. So when the coaster got to the top of its first incline, which is also the highest point of the roller coaster at 50 feet, somehow the drive chain snapped. Now there is an option for a manual brake, which the brake man was there. He saw what happened and he was desperately trying to stop the train, but he couldn't. So the train would then start rolling backwards at a pretty high momentum and then it would round a corner and completely derail off of the tracks. Now, each train consists of three separate cars. One of those carriages was crushed by the other two. There were two teenage boys and a young girl who were instantly killed. And then two more passengers were rushed to the hospital, but they would also die. Of the five people who unfortunately lost their lives that day, two of them were part of this group. To go along with the five deaths, 13 other people were seriously injured. Just try to imagine what they went through. Not only does the train go backwards when it's not supposed to, but two of the carriages literally fold on top of the other one, with 31 people inside those carriages. After an investigation, prosecutors would call the Big Dipper a death trap. Charges of manslaughter were brought forward to the park's owner and the ride's engineer, but ultimately, they were all cleared, and the park closed forever two years later. Hello, True Crimers! It's time for another episode of Deaths at Theme Parks. Viewer discretion is advised. This lovely woman behind me was 21-year-old Lindsay Zeno from Lafayette, Louisiana. In July of 2010, Lindsay would visit Dixie Landon, which is a small theme park in Baton Rouge. Now, Dixie Landon is also adjacent to a water park called Blue Bayou. Blue Bayou opened in 1989, where Dixie Landon opened in 1999. One of the rides at the theme park is called Extreme. It's a chain lift roller coaster that goes around 38 miles an hour as the top speed. Its highest point is roughly 51 feet. Now, this coaster involves spinning cars in some capacity and every rider is secured in by one of those chest bars. Well, on that July day in 2010, Lindsay Zeno got on the ride. She was secured in, supposedly, and at some point during the ride, the chest bar flew up, and one of the people sitting next to Lindsay noticed her struggling to get the bar back over her chest, 
But again, because this right spins and it twists, Lindsay was not able to secure the bar back over her chest again. And the next thing people on the ride knew, Lindsay had dropped from the seat and she fell roughly 30 to 35 feet and landed on the concrete flooring below. Everyone on the ride described it as easily the worst thing they've ever witnessed. A person who is desperately trying to protect themselves, save themselves, but just was not able to do it. A month prior to this incident, the ride was inspected and it passed. The theme park did their due diligence and then the creators of the actual roller coaster themselves, they also did their due diligence by trying to investigate what exactly happened. Literally everything was functioning correctly. And in the end, they could not come up with a reason as to why the actual bar came loose. But all Lindsay's family knows is the bar did come loose and because of that, she died. It was the theme park's second incident, but only the first death. In 2006, a young boy fell about 20 feet and broke both of his arms and his legs, but he did survive. And that was on another ride at Dixie Landon. From what I can see, no one was held criminally responsible for Lindsay's death. I do know that lawsuits were filed, but a lot of cases like this, they don't reveal the end results, especially if they settled out of court. So I don't know if the family was successful at suing. That's a scary way to go though. Universal Studios Halloween Horror Nights is very popular amongst park goers, but did you know it started with a real nightmare? Hello, true crimers. This is another Deaths at Theme Parks. Viewer discretion is advised. Halloween Horror Nights started after Universal Studios realized the popularity of other theme parks like Knott's Berry Farm doing a gimmicky thing during the Halloween season. So in 1986, they launched their very first Halloween event. Now today, there's a lot more attractions involved in the Halloween event. Back then in 1986, it really just consisted of one attraction. And that was the Terror Tram. And I think in this picture, it's being driven by Chucky. He can't reach the pedals, that's silly. Really all that it was was just the popular uh, backlot tour tram just transformed to look spooky. <laughs> God, I want to go back there so bad. I love this place. On Halloween night, 1986, a park employee by the name of Paul Rebalde Brooks, he volunteered to dress up as a dead person and jump out and scare people on the tram. Because that's essentially what it was. There would be actors around the lot that would just do jump scares. By all accounts, he was super excited to do it and was really pumped. Now, he was waiting on uh, another tram that was stationary, and on the tram was basically him, the one actor, and then everything else on there were just mannequins dressed out to look creepy, or like a bunch of zombies. And then the tram would come filled with people, and he was supposed to jump out in front of the entire tram and, you know, perform the scare. Now, the tram consists of three carts. They do not know why Paul did this when he did it, but as the tram came, he did not jump in front of the first section. He jumped in between the second and third sections. And then what happened was, is he fell in between and got stuck underneath the tram. And then Paul was dragged at least 100 feet while he was screaming in terror and also being crushed to death. A real life nightmare was occurring on the terror train. Everyone could hear him screaming for help. The tram operator obviously stopped the tram, but then suddenly his screaming stopped. They called uh, emergency services, they got there, and around 9 p.m. that night, shortly after they arrived, he was pronounced dead at the scene. They don't know if it was a matter of him not being able to see the tram properly because it was dark outside. They don't know if he just misjudged his jump. I can't find any records of the family or anyone suing the park, so I don't know if that happened. I do know that Halloween Horror Nights was shut down for six years before it returned in 1992, and it's been going on ever since. Hello, True Kramerers. Just a little heads up, this Death Set theme park episode involves a pretty gruesome death. Viewer discretion is advised. Pictured here behind me is part of the Island County Fair at Whid Bay Island, which is in Washington State. Now, unfortunately, I can't find a photo of him, but 40-year-old Doug McKay worked at this fair. 
he was actually a co-owner of the fair. There was a ride there called the Super Loop. Now, I don't know if it's this style, or more specifically like this style, I'm not sure. But Doug McKay, while the ride was active, was oiling a part of the track. And as the ride was doing its loop, and it was full of passengers at the time, it was a really windy day. And because of the wind, his hair kind of blew upwards. And unbelievably, his hair got stuck underneath one of the wheels of the coaster. He was immediately lifted about 30 to 40 feet in the air. And apparently some metal rod that was sticking out cut into his throat. And Doug was still attached at the wheels. And as the loop was going, and this is where it gets gruesome, essentially he was scalped. And it was completely so it separated him and he then fell about 30 to 40 feet. And he was face up so his back landed on a steel beam of a fence. And allegedly they say that it, basically it folded his body in half just because of the sheer force of the drop. Doug McKay's body was in such a bad way that it, they didn't know what exactly was the cause of death from all of that that happened. From what I understand, the fair closed for a little bit, but then it reopened shortly afterwards, but the ride itself was closed for the remainder of the summer. And please don't make any remarks in the comments about like, oh, why was he standing there, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. He was there, and he died in a really horrible way. So I just hope that he is now resting in peace, and that somehow his family has also managed to find any kind of peace from this. Hello, True Crimeers. It is time for another Deaths at Theme Parks. Viewer discretion is advised. This story takes us to El Paso, Texas, and specifically in their answer to Disneyland, is what they claimed. It was called Magic Landing. It opened on the 4th of July in 1984, but by 1989, it would be closed and become a desolate wasteland. One of the major reasons why the theme park closed was because of a particular death. I don't have a photo of the victim, unfortunately. 18-year-old Frank Guzman was an employee of the park, and he operated one of the roller coasters. On September 3rd, 1985, he was operating the roller coaster he was in charge of, and at one point on the coaster, some of the uh, riders' hats fell off blew off in the wind, and apparently it landed on the track itself. So the three individuals told Frank that, hey, my hat fell off, are we able to get it? So Frank, using the little access staircase next to the tracks, he climbed to the very top, and the hat was in fact sitting right there on the tracks. He then reaches out to grab the hat. I don't know if he saw the coaster coming and thought he could get this done quickly, or if he didn't see the coaster or hear it at all. But the coaster, which had people on it, rode by exactly as the same time that he was retrieving the hat. The coaster sliced through his arm and it severed his arm completely off. The blood loss was immediate, and he almost passed out at the top. The coaster itself stopped because of a safety mechanism built in. Frank was helicoptered out of there and brought to a nearby hospital. The incident happened at 6.30 p.m. He was in surgery by 9.30 p.m., but he would not survive the surgery. Frank died from a severe loss of blood. And then just a few short years later, the theme park, who never recovered from the incident, closed its doors forever. There were talks of it maybe trying to reopen like a decade or so later, but it never happened. And to this day, there are still remnants, I believe, of the park. Hello, True Crimeers. This is another Deaths at Theme Parks. Viewer discretion is advised. Today's story is taking us to Adventure Island, which is located in Tampa, Florida. This park opened on June 7th, 1980. It's about 30 acres in size. It has about 10 water slides, two massive pool areas, 
and it's actually owned and operated by SeaWorld. And it is just across the street from Bush Gardens. One of the attractions there is the Key West Rapids water slide. This story takes place on that water slide in 2012. 21 year old employee Justin Inverso was a lifeguard at the very top of this ride. Lifeguard slash employee. He was up there, you know, as the person letting the people go down the slide. Now, Tampa, Florida is a, a place known for its intense lightning storms, thunderstorms, and water parks like this have built in systems so that people can be alerted should lightning be on the way. Sure enough, on this day in 2012, a thunderstorm was rolling in. Now, according to some reports, the water park did not notify the employees of the park in time during this particular event. But when they were notified, essentially all the employees who were basically in charge of the water slides, they were responsible for evacuating everyone from them because water and lightning don't mix. Justin was just doing his job. He was getting people out of the attraction as quick as humanly possible. Now, at one point, he was at the very top of the tower, so he was up here. His feet were submerged in a small pool of water. And then the lightning began to strike. And Justin was also 700 feet up on this tower in water. A bolt of lightning came out of the sky and struck Justin directly, basically sending a death pulse through his body. To those who were there, they witnessed him collapse to the ground. And when it was safe, other employees tried to give him CPR, but it was already very, very late. An ambulance was called, but when they arrived, Justin was pronounced dead on the scene. The water park would eventually be fined roughly $7,000, and this was through OSHA. And this was because the water park did not notify everyone in the park in the correct time frame. Had this been done sooner, Justin may still be alive. But the park remains open to this day. Oh, no. oh whiplash! Jesus! Oh. Oh. This is why I don't go on roller coasters. Hello, true crimers. This is another Deaths at Theme Parks. Viewer discretion is advised. Today, we are going to what is now an abandoned theme park in Scotland. This was the Loudoun Castle Theme Park in Galston in Scotland. The theme park opened in 1995, but it would close permanently in 2010. Apparently, it wasn't necessarily a fan favorite. One of the rides they had there was called the Rat Ride, and that's the ride that we were on at the beginning of the video. It would take a lot of whiplash-style turns around the tracks. It doesn't sound like it was like a super popular ride. At any rate, in July of 2007, the coaster was going about its normal business when it would stop working. 18-year-old Mark Blackwood was an attendant for the ride. Sometime around noon, when the ride had broken down, he climbed the tracks to go and look at the coaster. The coaster itself essentially stopped running, so it was stuck. So he got to that one, and all of a sudden, another cart was going around the track. And then the cart he was working on suddenly decided to go, which caused him to slip, but he was able to grab onto the ride itself. So unfortunately, he was dragged around the tracks, and you saw it kind of operating a little bit. It has very sudden, very sharp turns. He was clinging on with everything he had, according to a witness. The ride operator, when they noticed this, they stopped the ride itself. But unfortunately, Mark would lose his grip. When he was about 80 feet up on the coaster, which is essentially its highest peak, he would fall from there and he landed on the cement ground below. Mark was rushed to a hospital in Kilmarnock, but he would not survive. I can't seem to find any information as to whether or not his family filed any lawsuits, but if they did, it was all done kind of privately. 
the rat ride would close for a short time and then eventually be reopened. But then the entire park itself, like I said earlier, was closed permanently in 2010. Hello, true crimers! <laughs> Gosh! <laughs> We're going to Disney again! <laughs> <clears throat> I have embarrassed myself enough. It's time for another Deaths at Theme Parks. Viewer discretion is advised. And today we're going to the wildest land at Disney, Frontierland. It's the home of rides like Big Thunder Mountain, Splash Mountain, and attractions like Tom Sawyer's Island. And this is where our story takes place. Tom Sawyer's Island is resting comfortably off of the rivers of America, and it's a fun attraction for all ages. You hop aboard a raft and you go across the river. The island is full of little caves and just all sorts of fun places to explore. Well, two young individuals were doing just that in 1973. An 18-year-old young man and his 10-year-old brother. They were having a good time over at Tom Sawyer's Island right as the park was about to close. And these two young men did something that everyone wants to do at some point in their life at Disney. They hid and waited for the park to close effectively becoming stowaways at Disneyland. This is not recommended, by the way. Highly frowned upon. Don't do that. All the park goers were gone, and the cast members were getting ready to close their respective attractions and restaurants. And after several hours of hiding on Tom Sawyer's Island, the two brothers decided, you know what, we should probably go now. So they jumped in the river. Now, the most shallow part of the Rivers of America is about four feet, and the deepest part is a little over eight feet. Now, the older brother put the younger brother on his back and decided to swim across the river. This apparently became too much too quickly, and the older brother was beginning to submerge underwater by the weight of his younger brother. The younger brother, not realizing what was going on, it was dark. The older brother suddenly kind of just fell away from the younger brother. So the 10-year-old began to doggy paddle to the shore where he eventually made it, but he couldn't find his older brother anywhere. Cast members noticed the 10-year-old, so they went to his aid and helped him out, but even they couldn't find the 18-year-old. It wouldn't be until the following morning when there was light that they would discover the deceased body of the 18-year-old boy. He had actually drowned. Just follow the rules, everyone. In 1984, another person would drown in the same river. Two drunk 18-year-olds stole a motorboat that's used for maintenance. Well, they crashed into a rock and one of them was thrown overboard. He was so drunk, he drowned. Who wants to go to Disneyland with me? I want to go. Like, legit. 